Um, and while I think there are many younger companies uh, in the space who are competing and trying to shift that paradigm, Pukan has to be developed over years, um, we will see more of those companies really accelerating the data um, and bringing out products that are primarily relying on data usage and not just the physical part of the product, I think. Hello and welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the Auto Tech Show, our podcast that takes a deep look at the world of automotive innovation, technology, and solutions. My name is Mark Babin, your host, and as always, it's great to have you all on this exciting new show. Now, on today's show, we are entering the realm of data-driven innovation and its profound impact on automotive companies. From big OEM manufacturers and service centers to the niche operators, data has become literally the fuel propelling innovation forward. But how can businesses leverage all the data that they're getting to rapidly increase many elements of their business from an innovation and an adoption standpoint. Now, to help us answer these questions and provide some insight into its complexity, I'm excited to welcome to the show Tom Ludersdorf, founder and CEO at Altihash, a company representing a major leap forward in data storage done by streamlining this storage of raw data and enabling industries to further harness the power of the data that they're collecting more effectively, a fantastic initiative and some great work being done by the team. Tom, I think we have a very uh, a critical talk today when we talk about this data topic. Uh, it's one that's been hashed out a lot around the world, but I really like this specific angle that we're going to tackle on it today, uh, especially when we're looking at this data revolution state that we're in. And of course, we're going to get there. But first and foremost, thank you so very much for your time today. I know you have a lot going on, but I appreciate you jumping on the show. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So as I said, there's lots we're going to get into, but before we dive into some of the more complex and, and detailed topics, perhaps a bit of context when we talk about data in automotive. From the work you do and, and you're surrounded by this, how do you see automotives currently leveraging all of this data that's available to them when they look at advancing their business forward in terms of innovation, product development, customer experience? The list goes on and on, but how are companies currently leveraging it all? Right. So I guess automotive companies are leveraging data in several transformative ways. And I think we need to divide that in mainly three sections, mm -hmm. right? Cars itself are physical product. Um, and in that physical production process, at first there is the manufacturing. And all the data analytics that's coming out of that production process um, is used in order to enhance the quality control and reduce costs. Uh, for example, when we think about all the sensors that are used there, the production locks, um, in order for manufacturers to identify the bottlenecks and forecast potential defects. Um, and these defects are then hopefully seen as early as possible, so the car is not even going on the street. But then in the manufacturing process, we can minimize any of these faults in the product. Mm -hmm. The second part is then when we go into the life services in the car, right? Something that we experience when we drive with a car, security services, in-car infotainment systems, and maybe more closer than, uh, than we first thought, autonomous driving even. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are advanced systems in our cars, in our physical product, that make the process of driving or being driven more secure um, and more reliable and probably even more enjoyable. And then the last part, I think, and this is this is more new, uh, we talk about adaptive services throughout the car's life cycle. We can think about basic things like our cars remembering the preferred seat position we have or the climate control settings that we're used to. But I think this is an area where it can go much further than that. Uh, when we think of the car not just being one one piece of metal, if we want so, <laughs> yeah. that is um, that is driving us from A to B. But when we think more of it like uh, a technology um, and a software uh, that can combine the information that uh, it, from the service it has to do, like bring us from A to B, but also with the surrounding, when we think of weather, traffic, 
or even appointments that we have to make with a mechanic, right? When is the right time to change our car, our um, our wheels? Um, so I guess we need to see the car more of, I would say, an iPhone on wheels. And the question that we have to answer, and hopefully the um, automotive um, companies will answer, who's going to be the first one to build the app store for the car? Yeah, it's a really good question. I like how you broke the services into three different areas there, because it's, it's true. They're all very different elements and how they're collecting, using, and, and really leveraging a lot of this data. Traditionally, over the past number of years, we've seen automotive lag behind in terms of adoption and and taking on new technologies and ways of using new technologies in general and through the work that you've done, especially over the last two years, the last 24 months, would you say that automotive companies in general are still lagging behind other industries in the way that they're using a lot of this data? Or are you actually seeing some relatively positive progress in the last couple of years? Well, overall, we've seen some notable progress. There are some companies we think are still catching up uh, on this, but over the last 24 months, um, I think we've seen a lot of push towards data-driven innovation. Um, and this is on the one hand, because we see um, long developed systems like autonomous driving systems getting onto our streets in some parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And we see the innovation actually happening, which has been worked on for more than two decades. Um, but then also many of the OEMs, they are really heavily investing into data analytics and AI. Now, data analytics is something that is much closer to their uh, manufacturing process mm -hmm. um, and therefore to the innovation um, they need in their product. But I think also AI um, and leveraging that data from heterogeneous sources for their product uh, development is something that they're exploring. Um, and I would uh, say we go even further than exploring, but the first products are brought into production. But then I think there is, a, there is in, in some way, it's an unfair comparison to some other industries, the automotive industry. Because when we think about the development life cycle of a car, it's not something that is happening within months. It's often something that's happening for years. Um, and while I think there are many younger companies uh, in the space who are competing and trying to shift that paradigm, the car has to be developed over years, um, we will see more of those companies really accelerating the data um, and bringing out products that are primarily relying on data usage and not just the physical part of the product, I think. Mm -hmm. As companies sort of start to take these initial steps, and again, if we kind of look at those three different services as, as one holistic group, and, and you can break them down further if you think it's necessary, but let's talk about the quality and the robustness of that data. What measures do they have to take in order to ensure that that robustness and the quality is not lost and it's just a massive amount of stuff coming in. Like, how do you, how do you maintain that robustness and, and what steps do you take as you take these steps forward? Yeah. So when we, when we think about those automotive companies, um, I think it is something that we need to understand that there's a lot of different data sources mm -hmm. that are useful here. Um, and the best way to organize data that is so different is to have a data platform to keep the organization at first, very simple. So if possible, I think an architecture that's centralizing the data rather than distributing it makes it easier to keep a good organization. Um, and then we think about uh, data, of course, in a way that's not something we just want to store for a month and then erase again from the storage, but we want to keep this data for a long time. Uh, most of the companies uh, that, or actually all of the OEMs that we've seen um, in the production process, they are keeping their data for decades uh, to make sure that the entire product journey from the manufacturing on can be traced back. So here we really talk about data that is stored for decades and governance is a second part that is super crucial here. Uh, ideally, and I think that that needs to be a given, the data governance needs to be central across the entire organization. If that's not the case, we really have a high risk of creating a data swamp. So aggregating a lot of data without the reliability and actually being able in the future to make any sense of the data. Um, and then when we integrate the data, of course, we want to make sure it 
is in predefined classes. Uh, we're actually at least labeling the data in a way so we can find it again. The worst case scenario that we have is really data that is stored for no purpose in mind without the ability that we can resurface it later and actually make sense out of it. And in order to have this as a process that is continuously happening in company, we need to invest or those companies need to invest into employee training. Um, and here in particular, the data engineering side uh, needs to make sure that the data is handled responsibly and that there's a culture that makes sure that prioritizing data quality is a key step at the aggregation process. I like that you mentioned the the ensuring that the quality through the actual like manual input of it or the collection point of it as well. And I think based on what you guys do, you have an interesting take on this quality versus quantity debate and you touched on it there, but just to dive into it a bit more, obviously we want as much data as possible coming from as many different sources. It creates a more fuller picture, a more transparent picture. It opens a lot of doors that maybe were closed before, but at the same time, we don't want to sacrifice quality. We don't just want to just take every little breath that comes across our table. So from obviously you guys are dealing with bringing in a lot of data, organizing, as you said, what's your take on this quality versus quantity debate? Is there a balance to be had? Do you see priority shifting to one or the other right now? What's your take? Well, we really see that collect, uh, collecting vast amounts of data is tempting for most businesses, Absolutely. Um, no matter the industry. Um, and that's the case for manufacturers as well. Um, the first focus in my view still should be on quality mm -hmm. and then secondly on quantity because it's very powerful if we can have quality and quantity in sync. That's really when we can leverage the data. On the other hand, if we have a lot of quantity and no quality of the data, we run into this potential battle that we have high costs for something that doesn't really provide us any business value. Mm -hmm. And that's one time going to be cut. Um, and that's going to be a very, very critical moment for a business because the intention to keep that data was done with a very positive intent. We want to maybe in the future leverage the data for our product innovation. Um, and we've seen companies where that, that promise of getting um, innovation from your data is pushed so far in the future that they had to make the hard decision to delete some of the data, mm -hmm. which is oftentimes, and we've, we've seen it over the last two years with some of our clients, which oftentimes is regretted afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so here we really, we really advocate for making sure that when data is ingested, uh, we have a high quality uh, and have an intent with that data so that quantity isn't a problem. But then it is right what you say, the, the unique positioning of Altihash is really that we try to find a balance here. Because the reality is oftentimes we store data um, with an intent, but maybe the technologies to analyze the data or to further process the data and enrich the value of it is not there the next two years, maybe next the next five years. So we want to make sure while this lifetime um, of the data um, is actually only starting in five years to get us any value. In these five years, we really have a low cost uh, footprint of it um, as possible. So here with Altihash, we're building a storage that allows customers when they are ready to have a fullest performance, um, analyze their data, use it with large language models if they want so, or perform machine learning on the data. But while we are in this phase of figuring out how we want to process the data, we keep the costs and the resources required as low as possible. Yeah, because it's not being leveraged yet and therefore the advantage doesn't come as fast, I imagine, like you said. When people are thinking about, okay, I want to collect it from here, I want this data point, I want this data point, you mentioned intent. Is that intent point come before starting to collect or as you collect, you sort of build that intent as you're organizing that data, should it already have a home before it's collected? I guess the intent from collecting data is often done when we set a center, mm -hmm. when we turn on the camera, yeah. when we 
build the device that is actually able to capture that data. Mm-hmm. Um, so at that point on time, uh, at that point in time, we already have the intent, and oftentimes it's a given. Now, then there's a second choice, which is when we put our data to the disk and we make a decision: what's the retention time? Mm-hmm. How long do we want to take this data? Is this something that is important for security? Um, do we need traceability of this data for the next 30, 40 years because this product is going to be in the market that long? It's a clear answer on what is the retention going to be. Or do we think that in the in the next few years, this data is going to be useful in some way? Um, and we keep that option open, may, give it a cheap storage, um, but in the future, when we want to use it, then we can. All we know already, this is data that was only useful in order to give us insights in the time right now. Mm-hmm. And then we will probably delete it. And that's also completely fine. Um, if we look across industries, the majority of data is captured and then deleted shortly after again. It is the data that we keep for a longer time, which is really brought in with the intent to create more value from it. But as I said at the beginning, often this intent is quite clear. Um, and the what, in my opinion, counts as intent is the imagination of engineers, of those that are setting up a process that there is potential to optimize. Um, and if we can do that, and I think it's a very good reason to keep that data as a source for learning in the future. Yeah, even if it's used in real time, like you said, that can still be useful to that organization somewhere at some point, whether it's from a customer point of view, from a manufacturing point of view, development, further innovation, no matter how it's used, uh, you don't want to just give it up. And therefore you need to be able to manage it efficiently and be able to access it when you need. And I think that's what a lot of people, the gap that a lot of people have is I want to keep it, but I don't know how to keep it. Is that sort of the conversation you see having as well? Partially. Um, I guess here we are venturing in two different directions, really. Um, When we get back to the three sections that we have, Mm -hmm. let's think about all the data that we are getting live in our car. There's a lot of data. There's so many data sources that we can set up in our car. It can be, even when we think about um, data points in our car, like the windshield wipe, when it is activated due to different weather conditions, of course, that's an information we can keep. Do we think we actually need it? Um, and if it's if it is it relevant for to enhance the user experience um, of our of our driver um, in the future? Maybe, maybe not. Um, maybe uh, we can come up with a way how to do it, but potentially it is not. So we can erase that information, right? But then we have other things that are more important for the behavior, and then we go more into behavioral studies, right? What is it that the user really cares about? Uh, what kind of data do we want to have? Uh, for that user to have a better user experience when they're driving a car. So we're putting here the user in the in the center and try to figure out, okay, what are the data points that can really make this life easier? And I think that's really what the adaptive services are about. Um, And when we can figure out how to bring more data into that, um, into our into our larger models that we are training in order to build products that enhance the user experience. Then we ask the question, okay, some of the data is gathered in an IoT device. If we see the car as an IoT device uh, that's on the edge, how do we get this into a cloud environment in order to train larger language models or train other um, other uh, applications to do data analytics on the data or some form of machine learning if it is uh, an unstructured data source? and then figure out how we can, from that insights, produce a a product that can go back into the car. So kind of to close the loop from the car as a data source into the data center to produce a product and then give it back to the user. Um, But then that's, that's, I guess, uh, the the one question where we have, how do we get the data from A to B from the car into the data center? Yeah. And it seems like, like you said, cars are are essentially smartphones on wheels now. So that's only getting easier. And I guess as that, like say that was a gap that existed before, as that gap is closed, obviously technology is closing other gaps and we're creating this loop 
that you said where technology is innovating technology on its own and it's just going to continue to do does that exponential speed obviously as it ramps up then how difficult does it get from a management point of view of all these different data points because now it's just what used to be manageable and maybe a bit more controllable is just becoming rapid fire and this loop is getting faster and faster we're seeing new solutions come faster and faster because the technology that invented it is now inventing new things it's just it's continuous but then the behind all of that magic there's a massive pot of information that must become just increasingly complex to manage right so here we really come down to to making sure that the platform or the architecture that we store on the data in gives us this elasticity to first process data in various ways mm -hmm. um, to scale up and down for the amounts of data that we need so it really comes down to how do we think about capturing and using that data um, and that is that is uh, at least a a problem that we can solve with technology. It's very simple to, to solve in a way because we have very good frameworks out there um, that we are advocating as for uh, as well for. So for all for all customers that are working with data analytics tools, mm -hmm. want to do uh, maybe machine learning, for them it's really important that, that we see that they are shifting quickly to a modern data uh, lake house architecture or to a modern data lake mm -hmm. architecture at least which allows them to access it, uh, the data centrally and then in parallel process it with in different ways. So to keep it simple, when, when we see that companies like OEMs have a lot of different data sources, we really try to keep the data central, then allow them to keep consistency across the data, uh, central data mm -hmm. and help them with the governance so that on top of it, then when they want to do data analytics for predictive maintenance or for quality insurance, they can process this structured data from their production process. Um, and maybe they can data can be organized in a table in order to run some statistics. Fantastic. But then we have different use cases as well where we have image data, right? Maybe we want to have here some form of image recognition. Uh, let's say we take a picture from a uh, from a, a part of the car that is manufactured um, at the end of the production process. And here we want to make sure that there's no anomaly um, and we can really ensure the quality of each piece that is going through the production process. Then we probably want to train a machine learning model that can detect uh, various objects as well as differences uh, that are unexpected and verify them. Or then of course in the automotive industry, when we go further, uh, into higher complexity, we think about autonomous driving systems, mm -hmm. right? Here we have so many different data sources utilizing video data, sensor data of various forms in order to learn from a lot of different varieties and situations that we have out there to make an informed decision mm -hmm. in a more advanced neural network. Um, and in order to process all that data and make use of that data, it's really important that we have a reliable infrastructure that helps us to do so in an efficient way. And here's something that, that we really care about is to make sure that efficiency means performance in combination with resource efficiency. Because something that we have seen is that imagination is very hard to justify when the costs are too high. Mm -hmm. We often see that um, pipe dreams can come up in a company when the reality and the imagination are too far from another. Uh, so this is also where I see the important task of technology and software in particular to close that gap. Um, and we've often seen that when we have better technology to utilize a resource, that doesn't often mean we do less with it but we actually do more with it, right? Let's, 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 for example, think about LEDs, completely different topic, but LEDs haven't allowed us to use less light, but probably more light uh, because we use much less resources for it. And I think the same we can do with building more resource efficient solutions for data storage with Altihash to make sure that companies can use more of their data 
and use it efficiently in the architecture that really allows them to process it then in a way that they can capture that value. Yeah, and ensure it's not lost and ensure that everything is actually, all that original intent is actually put to use uh, rather than just yeah being lost in the shuffle, like you said. I think that's super important. Is that what the kind of the the that side of it gets you excited about the potential of a lot of what's being collected? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, and I see that we need a lot of acceleration because mm-hmm. I'm I like to drive cars. I'm excited for the services that we will have in the next five years in the mm-hmm. cars. Um, and that's also that's also where I really hope that uh, we can use data and uh, data driven innovation for the good in our product experiences, because it's not just something that companies should care about. Uh, but it's something that every user should care about, because in the end, um, a car is a product that's hard to neglect. Um, if you don't drive, you probably have been in your life sitting in the car, uh, whether you've been driven or maybe you've just been at an auto show and admired the design of it. But it's definitely something that all of us have probably experienced in some way. So using data in order to make our user experience better is really something I think we should all care about or can all care about. Yeah. What, what cars we drive or cars we use or vehicles we use, or even everything attached to our lifestyle, how it relies on a vehicle somewhere and that having the ultimate experience is, is a, at the end day affects us no matter where we are in our life and what we're doing. So I think it makes everything better. Uh, and it's exciting. Like you said, like it is exciting to see what's coming and how fast things are coming. It used to be like between decades, we see new innovations in vehicles and now it's faster than the newest iPhone. We're seeing new innovations in cars, which is super exciting that that's happening. Um, and, and yeah, something to look forward to as people get a hold of this concept of using everything more effectively. Like you said, there's a lot of missed potential in the past perhaps. And now we're seeing less and less of that, but obviously the work you guys are doing are helping to propel that. So no, I think it's great. And I'm, I'm super looking forward to what's next. But um, yeah, fantastic insights, Tom. I really, really appreciate your time today uh, and some great, great insights and answers to, to some of the questions here. So really, really appreciate your time. Uh, before we close out on this episode, any final notes uh, from your side? Anything that you wanted to touch on? Uh, I guess there's nothing else to add. Um, no, thanks. Perfect. Mark. Good. No, it was great having you again and uh, wish you and your team the best of luck. Uh, over the summer months and into the end of the year, but certainly be keeping a close eye on the work you guys do. So again, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. And for everyone watching and listening, thank you very much for joining us on this episode of the Auto Tech Show. It's been great having you with me. Hopefully you've learned a lot and you have a lot of great new insights to think about when it comes to the use of this data and how it can perhaps uh, having a better organization, a better handle of what you're collecting can obviously help you utilize that a lot better and fulfill a lot of those original intents. If you have any questions about what you heard today, head down to the podcast notes. You'll see uh, LinkedIn links for both myself and Tom. Please reach out if you have any questions you want to add to the conversation. You never know that could spark a new episode of the show here. So please go ahead and do that. We'd love to be in touch. But with that, we'll bring this episode to a close. Again, thank you all so very much for joining me on this episode. We have a new episode coming very soon. But until then, wishing you a great day, no matter where in the world you may be. We'll talk to you guys soon.